Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Migration Policy Institute video chat. My name is Michelle Middlestad. I'm with the Migration Policy Institute. And uh, we're just glad uh, that you're joining us today and taking the time for what's going to be a lively discussion um, between Migration Policy Institute President Dimitrios Papadimitriou and Kit Rockless, the editor in chief of the American Prospect magazine. Just by quick um, explanation, uh, Dimitri has a cover article in this month's edition of American Prospect that focuses on the uh, fundamentals of immigration reform and so he and Kit are going to be um, engaging in a conversation right now about some of uh, what Dimitri wrote in the article which is really looking at what are some of the deliberate and unintended policy consequences that have created the immigration system that we have in the United States today as well as some of the key uh, topics for reform uh, that are uh, that should be considered in the ongoing immigration debate that are uh, not being talked about as fully as some of the others right now so with that I'm gonna turn it over to Kit to begin the conversation and just mention one thing if at any point during uh, today's conversation you would like to ask a question uh, please hit us up on Twitter uh, with the hashtag MPI Hangout or email us at communications at migrationpolicy.org and we'll get to your questions um, after Kit and Dimitri's discussion. So with that, Kit. Thank you, Michelle. Dimitri, good to see you. Welcome on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, here's so everybody understands what the kind of format will be today. Um, I'm going to play Charlie Rose to Dimitri's Dimitri and ask him a set of questions that I think will engender, I hope, um, a conversation uh, between the two of us about the state of um, immigration reform and to kind of delve deeper into the article he wrote for, um, in The Prospect. Um, Dimitri, let's begin with what's changed since you wrote the piece. Um, the piece appeared two and a half weeks ago and it seems almost a lifetime has passed um, in the state of immigration reform. Two or three sort of major things have happened since then I was wondering whether you could begin to kind of outline what those are and what you think the effect is on um, on the chances of reform. Thank you, Kid. It's great to have this conversation with you. And um, I must say, this has been one of the most pleasurable things that I ever had to do. I dreaded it, but what can I say? It turned out to be um, really nice. Well, thank um, you. And you know better than anybody else that the piece was actually written about six or seven weeks ago. So it's not just the two and a half weeks that have lapsed since the publication, but you know, it goes back, you know, to the late January. I think the one thing that has changed dramatically is that the legalization process, the earned legalization process, seems to have been adopted not only by the eight senators, the gang of eight but by increasing numbers of notables throughout um, the Republican Party. So something that was perhaps a bit chancy when uh, I was writing and was suggesting that the momentum, you know, is, is enormous and that a lot of people thought that we were going to have immigration reform possibly even this year. It seems that that momentum has continued to grow and that some of the difficult issues that we anticipated you know, in the article have appear, or at least I should say, appear to be less difficult today. Uh, there has also been progress you know, in the discussions between labor and business, although I must say, uh, as I always felt, having been uh, on this issue and around the table with both of these interests, that the devil continues to be in the details and every day or every other day there is another article that suggests that you know negotiations are broken down over this or that item. Um, the other things that seem to you know not have been on the agenda or at least not have been major issues at the time that the article was written and upon the publication of the piece have to do with perhaps lesser issues, but those lesser issues become very important, which have to do, in other words, with constituency policies, politics. Uh, I still do not know today how this whole family issue is going to play out, because mm -hmm. there's still so many people who are arguing for increasing family numbers, others are arguing for paying more attention to the closest family relationships, and this is something that 
has not been paying attention to, although perhaps deals have been made that we're not aware of. Can you explain that issue a little bit more in depth? What, what are the constituents who are arguing for what, and what are, the, what are the justifications for the various positions? I don't need you don't have to go through all of them, but the basic positions that that are being, you know, that are that are that are being taken now. Yes, and they are essentially of two different two different types of of uh, difficulties. The one has to do with numbers, what we call backlogs. And they're massive backlogs, particularly on family immigration, uh, which is, you know, something that we have known that goes back decades that may reflect a miscalculation when this part of the legislation was written back 45, 47 years ago in 1967, in 1965. But by and large, it has to do with the United States being unable to make a decision of whether we're all in when it comes to family or we really are going to have them sort of wait there forever. And in the article, we have some of the numbers that uh, the waiting lines, how long it takes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the other part of it has to do with how you define family. And here is where I think, you know, we're going to have a difficult time. There are a lot of people, particularly, you know, among Latins, among Latinos, but especially among Asians, that are intent on keeping the current system in terms of family relationships, regardless. In other words, even if people have to wait 15 or 20 years before they can come in the United States. And the one category that is, you know, under particular um, that's of particular interest to both people who are trying to cut back on numbers, but also to people who want to defend those numbers, is what we call the fourth family, fourth preference, which is brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. This is not a large number of visas in the overall scheme of things. It's about 65,000 visas. Um, but there is this argument as to whether you need these numbers or not whether you should take some of these numbers and reunify members of the immediate families for U.S. legal permanent residents, not U.S. citizens. This way, mothers are not separated from daughters, spouses are not separated from their spouses, and we could actually stand by the principle of family unity. So these are all complicated issues. Um, there hasn't been much discussion in the media about it, and I think at the end of the day, compromises will have to be, to be made and people will have to figure out what's more important or less important to them. So as of today, knowing that you could change your mind late this afternoon or tomorrow morning, are you more optimistic or less optimistic than you were when we sent the piece off to the printer? That's a tough question. I think I'm more optimistic. But it sounds like you're guardedly more optimistic. I am guardedly more optimistic. Primarily um, because I worry about these details. You know, I know that in terms of the, the headlines, the top of the line news, there seems to be agreement across the board, more or less. And anyway, those things will be fought out, you know, once a bill is introduced and all that. But at the end of the day, is the amendments that I'm worried more about rather than the actual um, legislation that will be introduced. So that is what I focus on and try to anticipate what might come down the, you know, sort of the time, the, the line, and how, what is the best argument, analytically based argument, to use in order for us to make more intelligent choices. So one of the things that seems a bit mysterious, uh, particularly in the last few weeks, has been the White House role. Can you sort of describe what you think their strategy is at this point? Is it to take, I don't know if back seat's the right role, right word, right cliche, um, perhaps there's another cliche, but that they're deliberately um, pl playing a behind the scenes role p behind particularly the eight senators? Is that right? In, or what role are they playing? How are they shaping this legislature, this legislation um, in your mind? Uh, I think you have described it very well. I think the White House is very active in this process. 
but I do not want to be particularly public about it. After all, the White House team on these issues has two of, you know, among the most expert people on immigration anywhere. And one of them, the former top aide to Senator Kennedy, uh, is someone that has, you know, long standing relationships with staff on the Hill. So I suspect, and I want to emphasize this is, you know, my guess, that there is an awful lot of interaction, an awful lot of back and forth with the White House. And the President, I think, probably learned a bit of a lesson when, you know, there was a, a release, unintended release, of uh, certain sections of the bill that had been drafted already by the White House drafting team. Um, I think that upset an awful lot of the senators, uh, and the, the decision probably was made at that time that we were not going to have any more of this, that it was more important to try to shape the legislation that continued to threaten, you know, the Congress that if, if they don't come up with a bill by a date certain, you know, the President was going to put his own bill on the table. And I think that's actually the smarter thing to do. Uh, try to shape the legislation this way. There are a few things that the, the White House and at least the, the group of eight senators have to argue about when the bill gets put into the hopper. So can you give me your sense, again, I know this is contingent, on what you think the timetable might be? Um, what's the timetable being discussed now? Um, uh, my sense is, and everyone, you know, the people who uh, have been talking to many of the actors is that we're going to have a bill that will be introduced sometime soon after Congress comes back from recess. They're coming back on the 8th. I know they're not going to drop a bill on the 8th, but maybe the end of that week, maybe the following week. I think what has held things back are some of the details. And we're going to have to live with these details, you know, over the next several months as this bill goes through its legislative process. And some of the details were, you know, particularly between business interests and labor interests that seem to, at one point, seem to have a better understanding and agreement on key issues. But when you get down, down to issues of wages, you know, uh, labor conditions, etc., the kinds of things that newspapers, you know, don't pay too much attention to. These are very fundamental issues for both parties to this conversation. And now you will recall that as the article was being written, and I think after I said it to you, there was a big announcement that labor and business had reached an agreement. And that agreement was based on three principles. And at that time, you and I had a conversation as to whether to say something about this agreement, and we opted not to because, you know, the agreement was simply too general. And indeed, you know, every other day there seems to be an argument, sort of flash fire here and there, you know, that erupts between those two interests. And the process more or less has been taken away from negotiations between these two interests. And now the shots are being called by the Senate staff and principles, uh, with, of course, labor and business interests uh, reacting to the various proposals. We're not there yet on this particular issue, perhaps more than any other issue. We're not there yet. One of the things that seems striking um, about this reform effort, and it seems particularly striking in the context of American politics in the beginning of the 21st century, is that those in favor of reform are not necessarily um, people you normally would associate as allies. Um, it includes the Chamber of Commerce, but obviously labor would like to see reform happen too, but on its terms, but also evangelicals and as well as um, long-time long um, immigration reform advocates. Um, and it seems that you, and I think one sees this, you know, partly in Rand Paul's, you know, quite loud and, and very important shift of positions, that the, um, that the, it's not just the realization of the, of the importance of the Latino, the rise of the Latino population, 
in the United States, but that the effect of the evangelical um, community and Chamber of Commerce is having a sizable impact on the Republican position in all of this. Would you would you agree? Or and are there any other players that I'm leaving out on this? No, because I agree totally with him, and I think this reflects more than anything else a very systematic effort on the part of the pro-immigration coalitions out there. Uh, you know, the, the Immigration Forum, which, you know, for a long time used to be the, you know, sort of premier organization now is one of many on this issue, has basically targeted the evangelicals, the police associations, etc., etc., in order to bring pressure to bear on Congress by all of these you know, um, outside, as it were, interest people or players that didn't necessarily, to the best of my memory, play any role in previous conversations. Uh, but immigration has always been a story about strange bedfellows. <laughs> it is amazing at the end of the day whom you see going to their separate rooms up together. <laughs> and, you know, as the bill finally, you know, makes it to its almost final stage. But this outside strategy, bringing pressure from the outside to Washington, to U.S. Congress, you know, and the meetings with the President and all of that, I think is an extremely well-designed uh, uh, pattern or, you know, um, um, a policy on the part of pro-immigration coalitions to demonstrate to those people who are still skeptical as to whether to go this way or that way, to demonstrate that indeed there is an awful lot of support for immigration reform, roughly along the lines that have been outlined by the eight senators, and that that support comes from the very same communities from which key senators, not just the eight ones, key senators also come. Right. I think this is powerful. Let me shift the conversation a little bit um, from, you know, the from the, what we've been talking about, which is the makings of reform and what what both the politics and policy, to let's let's assume that reform gets passed. Um, that leaves many many questions, but there are at least two or three that come to mind. One, which is that the makeup of the the undocumented which now numbers 11 million, is going to surprise a lot of Americans. You and I have talked about this, um, which is that most of us, um, I think, are not aware that 40% of those who are unauthorized in, this, in the United States are here as visa overstays, and they represent often, not exclusively, but often both different nationalities, but also um, come from a different social class. Um, can you talk a little bit about both the visa overstay issue and what that's going to say if, in fact, we do offer um, we do offer a, a, a means for which the unauthorized can at least achieve a green card? Yes, and that's also an extremely important question because, as you said, um, sort of this one of the background issues for most of the conversations. The focus has been the border and the people who come, and particularly, of course, the southern border, and the people that come from that part of the region, you know, immediately to our south. And, you know, these are estimates, but they're very good estimates, and particularly they're estimates on which, you know, analytical organizations like mine and others and the government roughly agree on. So, at the end of the day, we'll find that roughly 55 or so percent of all of the unauthorized people from Mexico. Another 20 percent or so it will be from Central America and sort of the rest of the region, perhaps including the Caribbean. The rest is going to be from the rest of the world. Now, that does not amount to 40 percent, although visa overstays, overstays will be around 40 percent. And the addition of the difference between the numbers I just used and the 40 percent are people who come from these countries, but they have been able to get a visitor's visa or a business visa or, you know, a visa to study or what have you, legal visas. They come here legally 
and then they stay over. And I'm not really talking about the technical kinds of overstays, somebody who, you know, missed the deadline of departure by, you know, a week or two or three, but people who have basically inserted themselves, you know, into the US economy and society. And that number, uh, may perhaps even be larger than that because of certain other decisions that we took 15, 16 years ago whereby we said that if you're in the country illegally for you know, at least three months and the government knows that you're illegally, you're excluded for three years. And if you're here for more than a year and the government knows that because we have an entry visa, then you will be excluded from the country for 10 years. So in a sense, this may have had some deterrent value and may still do so, but at the same time it creates a perverse incentive for people who violate, you know, the, you know, their stay and the rules of stay in the United States, to basically burrowing in, into the economy and the society. So there will be surprises like that. In 1986, you know, we found <laughs> people who asked and received legalization from practically every country on earth. And I may not be surprising, but you know, when you have some uh, significant numbers of Japanese and Germans and all these other things, you realize, you know, that there is all sorts of people uh, who actually come to the United States and then stay on. One of the things that, one of the subjects that seems to me radically overlooked in the public conversation about immigration reform is a subject that I know is very, very important to you, which is what happens afterwards, which is what happens with, to use the policy term, you know, how do we implement reform, how do we integrate these 11 million people? Um, and that is both a costly, um, an issue of cost, if this is not cheap, and secondly, lots of fierce debate about what are the best ways to integrate a group of people who are radically different from one another. We're talking about enormous differences in education, enormous difference in skill levels, enormous differences in age, um, and obviously enormous cultural and national differences. And I know that the that you, um, um, you know, and the Institute have given an enormous amount of thought to this, but it is, it seems to me that my sense is that Congress has given far less thought to this, um, and that it's been shut it aside and all the talk about reform. What efforts have been done and what do you think should be done? And my sense from our own conversations is that you're less optimistic about this part of the process. And of course you're right again. <laughs> you and I have had too many conversations, clearly. <laughs> I only joke, of course. Um, integration at best is an afterthought in the US immigration system. Uh, for many reasons, you know, there are some people who are committed to reform, but they worry that if you put integration and the associated costs of integration on the table, it may derail an immigration deal. Right. So that's sort of, a, and that represents certainly, you know, a cross section of interests. Um, the other thing is that the, we're still, in a sense, suffering, as it were, from our own rhetoric, you know, that somehow the United States is simultaneously a melting pot that basically assimilates everyone, or at the same time, in the same argument, <laughs> an opportunity for people to go their own way and they all find their own way and we're all, we all live happily ever after. And, you know, historically speaking, this is both true and untrue, simultaneously. I think that now, with 11 million people who have, who will have an opportunity, I don't know, 9 million, however many of them will be able to make it through the process, we should think of this as an opportunity to arm these people, to enable these people to succeed, not only in our economy, but also in our society. So instead of seeing the kinds of integration measures that the legislation is likely to ask for, as punitive measures. For instance, when you say you have to learn English, you have to understand civics, you have to do this or that, we should see this as an opportunity that says, yes, you're about to become a member of this society, 
and we want to give you the tools to succeed, to succeed as a member of our communities, to succeed as a you know a member and an actor in our labor markets and our economy. That's an opportunity. It is not anything else than that. Now, where you're going to find the money, of course, is an entirely different issue. Uh, suggested you know two possible sources of money in the article. Uh, both of them would create some sort of a fund to which others may contribute that would allow the state to try to charge against it for the services that they would have to make to give you know to the legalizing of the population in order again to make a members successful members of the community this is going to be very very difficult you know the tendency of the US Congress in previous failed attempts has been to try to tax the immigrants through fines and other things in order to pay for additional border controls. And I suspect there is probably a whole bunch of people in the US Congress that automatically would aim for that. But I think it is time to separate what is a basic governance function for which we should pay, all of us, which is border controls, and what is something that builds cohesion or cohesiveness in the society, which is where this money should go to. And this is, as you said, a you know a set of ideas that the eight senators, particularly one of them, are only beginning to try to introduce into the conversation. Let me end with one final question, which I hope isn't too vague, which is that on any piece of legislature, legislation that is this huge, that has this many ramifications, there are the unknowns and to traffic in another cliche, there are the unknown unknown, unknown unknowns. So um, to ask perhaps an oxymoronic question, what do you think are the unknown, unknown unknowns that are not being dealt with here? Um, that are, is it simply that legislation that tries to map things out 10 or 15 years ahead is a near impossibility and therefore we should create systems that are flexible and adaptable and responsive. What are the unknown unknowns that you fear are going to come back and haunt this legislation just as there were, as you point out in the piece, whole number, perhaps in some cases they were known, but in some cases unknowns that have haunted previous efforts at reform. One of the right. things that keep you up at night about this particular oh an awful effort. lot of <laughs> a lot of things but the with the you know with the best reform possible there are still things that that are clearly worrying you uh, yes and thank you for asking this question because it is really you know a a question that sort of not only keeps me awake at night but it also stretches the ability of you know brains or of imagination to try to figure out, you know, what the problems might be 10 or 15 years down the road. Um, one of them is that the, that illegal immigration will continue in the United States, which worries me at a great deal and with a great emphasis because I think that this country has exhausted itself trying to come up with a solution to the illegal immigration problem that we have today. And I think that it is important that after legislation passes that we invest in the integrity of the new system that we create. This is not about zero illegal immigration. This is about trying to keep it at very low levels. This is a big country. We have a vast labor market there will always be some people who will, you know, exist here illegally. Uh, a second thing that worries me is that the U.S. Congress may decide, instead of looking forward, to look backward and make completely artificial decisions as to who should qualify for legalization and who should not. The last time that we had a big argument about immigration in 1986, we basically made that decision to 
allow people to claim legal status if they had been in the country for at least five years. That created the core around which the next wave of, of illegally resident people, like unauthorized people, came and settled in the country. So I'm terribly worried about the remainder, the leftover, as it were, because that, as you know, creates all sorts of incentives for employers that misbehave and pushes these people further into the underground economy. And I don't think this is of any interest to anyone. The third thing that worries me is perhaps a bit of the cone head in me. I'm worried about the country not being curious enough about the effects of policies that it enacts. It is extremely important for a country that plays the immigration game with as much gusto as we do, both the good end of it and the bad end of it, to not be curious and systematically analyze what the effect of policy decisions and policy decisions that we make is on immigrants, on workers that work next side by side with immigrants, on local economies, on the labor market, on the greater economy. We can't continue to do that. Every other country is much more curious about these things than we are. And I think we ought to somehow inject that curiosity gene into the next piece of legislation. Well, thank you. That was, uh, I think, a wonderful way to end at least this part of our conversation. Michelle, do we have any questions? Kit, we do have a couple of questions. Kit, we do uh, we have, have a couple of questions. A, uh, we have one Vermont coming in from a, a viewer in Vermont who asks, is how strong is the advocacy for converting all substantially workers all undocumented workers, workers into guest rather workers rather than permanent residents or a path to and citizenship? Who and who might be promoting this? So uh, I'm supposed to answer this. Is that what it is? Thank you. <laughs> uh, I apologize. So. Um, at the time that um, I was writing the article, uh, I think that it was a real possibility that there were going to be a lot of people who would see this as, in other words, not full legal permanent status, as sort of either the maximum that could be possible or certainly a desirable enough outcome. But I now think that there is an awful lot of water that has gone under the bridge and what we have is all roads moving in the direction of full permanent residence. It's going to take a while. You know, the latest estimate is, you know, a, a decade, perhaps 12 years. It's going to have several screens where people will have to, you know, do X, Y, and Z before they move from the one stage to the next one. It probably will cost a lot of money, but I think, and I'm guessing here because the House hasn't really spoken on these issues, uh, I think that at the end of the day we're going to have a full path to, uh, to citizenship as the, you know, the language, the political language says, which is really a full path to a green card. And there is even conversations or talk about then reducing the time that it takes for someone to become a U.S. citizen after they get a green card to three years rather than five years. So uh, I think that we're at a point now where the conversation has moved beyond um, the, the question or the concern that the caller seems to have. Was the most significant change, political change, around this issue was the Rand Paul speech in your mind, or does it, uh, or, or does it go back to Rubio? But it seems to be the Rand Paul speech represented a, kind of a, a, a truly distinct change in the tone of the debate. Yes, it, it was uh, uh, Senator Paul's speech. Uh, and it was also, you know, something else that when semi unnoticed or it was noticed but pri by primarily but primarily by by us who live, you know, in the immigration world. And this is sort of the lesson from what happened with um, Jeb Bush's book. Um, when Bush wrote the book last year, arguing for legal 
status and full work authorization that would be renewable, that would give people all the rights you know, that people had minus the right of uh, earning a green card seemed like the progressive thing to do among Republican constituencies. And six months later, uh, when the book came out, all of a sudden this was a position from a year ago, but most of the Republican leaders on this issue had moved beyond it and had agreed to, to green cards. Uh, like many other social issues, and I want to emphasize this as a social issue rather than anything else, uh, things are moving at lightning speed and um, change is happening right in front of our eyes and it's, it's happening very, very fast. So this seems to be something that is going to, you know, that we can agree on even with attempts on the part of some people in the House to try to, to sort of pull back from this position. I don't think that's possible to do at this time. Great. Um, Great. Um, I, have I have a question which is coming, which is coming in with a little bit of context first and then the question is actually, actually from somebody in Ireland. Ireland. Thank, Thank you very much for your question. question. Um, so the uh, question is uh, that uh, most workers in the U.S. agricultural sector are undocumented migrants. Without these migrants, the production of up to five to nine billion dollars of import sensitive commodities would be lost and 10 to 20 percent of the fruits and vegetables would have to be imported from other countries and um, the um, the uh, participant is uh, citing American Farm Bureau Federation um, findings. The question then comes here, given that one of the attractions of employing undocumented migrant workers is that they are a cheap source of labor and given that regularization may result in such workers either demanding better pay or moving to better paid employment, is it possible that regularization of undocumented migrant workers in agriculture will mean that farmers will not be able to employ as many workers and will therefore be forced either to reduce production or to make a change to producing crops that are less labor intensive and then finally therefore might regularization be a blow to US agricultural productivity? Wow. <laughs> So um, I'm glad, Michelle, that you could read all this, you know, without uh, uh, having to catch your breath several times. Um, agriculture has always been a special case, and it will remain a special case. Um, the and the group of eight has actually said this much that there will be a special, you know, sort of plan for agriculture. That plan will require that people work in agriculture for an extended period of time in order for them to gain status. So agricultural interests and you know their representatives, so, uh, uh, their advocates in the US Congress will see to it. Um, further, agriculture is one of the areas in which we have an extraordinary advantage of exports versus imports. It's a highly profitable uh, enterprise or activity or sector and I think everyone is intent on keeping it uh, that. And yes, wages are very low and there are some abuses, there are probably many abuses, but I must say that in so many different ways the United States is addicted to cheap labor. Uh, these low-end occupations cheap labor is essentially what allows people with low wages to be able to survive. For instance, it is not a surprise that the United States has among all countries spends the lowest percentage of household income in purchasing its food among all countries than of course any other country on earth and in fact the data is about six or eight years old. At the time that I was looking into this issue the average American household spent only about 10 percent of its income to feed itself and the second country after the United States was France and it was already at almost 20 percent. That's what I mean by addiction to low wages. So I think something special will be done for agriculture. I don't think anyone will argue <laughs> that, you know, somehow agriculture will have to sort of live within its means. 
uh, I think it's still not clear as to what kind of deal will be cut with regard to wages in particular for agricultural workers, but the supply of labor to agriculture is going to be going to continue to be ample. Great. Great. I think time will permit just one final question. Um, here's a question from California, which is, um, how is the mobility of persons going to be addressed? Um, uh, people who are in the process of regularization and need to go for medical reasons, for example, back to their countries of origin. Are you expecting more flexible advanced parole than occurred during IRCA? Uh, this is a very good question, and I, uh, all questions have been very good, of course. Um, I suspect that for a period of time during the registration period, things will be frozen in place. But for medical emergencies and the like, a parole system will have to be devised and it will happen. And after this nine months, 12 months, whatever it is, you know, after people register and begin, you know, they're preparing to change statuses and they get the original paper from USCIS, the immigration services. And then they are going to be able to travel at will, and you know. So the mobility issues that we encountered uh, during the 1986 or following the 1986 legislation that basically got people stuck here for two, two and a half years until you know, until everything was cleared. It doesn't have to happen this time. Uh, of course, the technology is different. Uh, we have much more experience under our belts, particularly with the DACA, the Deferred Action Group of people who were brought here at a young age, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that's not going to be an issue. Now, as with everything, when you're dealing with 11 million people, you know there are going to be all sorts of things that we have to worry about in terms of delays and mishaps and all that. But I'm pretty sure that mobility will be guaranteed. Great. Great. Well, uh, sorry, sorry Kip, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, you know, I was going to thank everybody for those who asked questions. Um, Michelle, I was going to thank you for, you know, doing a wonderful job of, of, of taking the questions and, and, and giving them to Dimitri and for you guys setting all of this up. This has been a wonderful conversation, and Dimitri is always a pleasure to talk to you about this. There's nobody more in the world I'd rather have this conversation with than you. And, Kit, I'd rather have you rather than any other interrogator. <laughs> I know that this is a Charlie Rose model, but we'll call you an interrogator. It's been a pleasure working with you on the piece and having this conversation. I thank you, my friend. Thank you, everyone.